Great. Welcome. Hi, I'm Arnold. I'm the, now the ex-president of CSEP. And um, today we have a question of kind of religion and economics and how they interact. And this is something that often when people discuss religion, currently in the media at least, it's quite often focused with violence and the impact that has on society. But a really interesting area of research is quite growing. And we have Dr. Sri Ayers, one of the leaders in this field, has been on the impact of religion and how they interact in the two of them. It dates back just to kind of Max Weaver and his work on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. And whilst that wasn't very valid, the new research that's coming out is really prominent and growing in terms of the effect we see on society. Now, today we have, I'm very honoured to have Dr. Shreya Iyer, who is the Isaac Newton Trust affiliated lecturer at Cambridge. She also is my boss as well as a fantastic lecturer, and so in that, and we're very fortunate to have her. So, without further ado. Thanks so much, uh, Arnav, Callum, and CSEP for the very kind invitation uh, to speak this evening. So let me begin by thanking you all very much for coming. Uh, as Arnav said, the subject of my lecture today is the new economics of religion. And I'm delighted to talk to you a little bit about the ideas and approaches that economists are using to understand religion and to present an overview of a very recent research project that I've been doing on India. Now, the economics of religion as a subfield of economics is relatively new, but the study of religion itself is ancient. Many other disciplines, notably philosophy, history, theology, anthropology, and sociology, have had much to say about religion and religious beliefs, as have scholars uh, from different parts of the globe. So for example, in his 1928 book, The Religion We Need, the distinguished Indian philosopher Sarvepalli Radhakrishnan wrote that religion is an expression of the spiritual experience of a race, a record of its social evolution, an integral element of the society in which it is found. There are many different definitions of religion. Substantive definitions of religion concern investigating religion as a philosophy or as a system of beliefs and using this to try to understand our world. In contrast, functional definitions focus more on what religion does for us or for people in terms of supporting them either psychologically or socially. But since the 1700s, um, scholars and writers from Galileo and Voltaire to Mark Twain have forecast the extinction of religion in general or some faiths in particular. In contrast to the abundance of research in these other disciplines, economists have frequently been accused of having neglected the role of religion um, in general. So for example, in 1993, Robert Nelson wrote, economists like to claim that their discipline is value free. In this view, an economist is a technician, like a plumber or electrician. Hence, religious values are no more a factor in preparing economic proposals than they are in repairing a furnace. Today, there are a very large number of international scholars who are invested and interested in the economics of religion, so times have really changed. There's been a six-fold increase in the number of economics papers alone published in this area in the last decade. So what has caused this sudden research interest? Well, one factor is that simply and very sadly, there are many more instances of religion-related conflict that we observe in the world today than in previous decades. Whether it's 9-11 in New York, Mumbai in 2008, or Paris in 2015, the concern with religion, and especially religion-related conflict, has become much more visible and immediate. So as a global modern phenomenon that has very serious implications now, both for life and for death, religion is not going away. But we are also able to study religion much more than we used to, simply because there is much more census and survey data that has now become available. We simply have more information on religious affiliation and religious beliefs than we ever had before. For example, a major international study of over 250 countries released by the Pew Research Center in 2012 showed that 84% of the world, that's about 5.8 billion people, currently report a religious affiliation. The study simply analyzed 2,500 censuses and surveys and as shown in this particular figure, the world's um, popular major religious groups in 2010 are Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and Jews. One of the more interesting findings of this particular survey is what's shown here by the red segment, which is the, uh, the ones that didn't report a formal religious affiliation, which actually makes them the third largest group in the sample. And of course, it is not just uh, the, the old who are religious. 
The young are also very religious as well. The median age for the world's population overall is 28 years, but some religions have on average much younger populations than others. The median age uh, for Muslims at the moment is 23, it's 26 for Hindus, and this is much lower than 36 uh, for the Jews. So one question that many economists and others really want to ask is that if we're seeing the increased salience of religion, is it at all related to income and growth? So in this particular graph, what I've got here on the x-axis is the per capita income in thousands and the percentage of people who are saying that religion is very important to them. And this data is from the Pew Research Center. And if you look at this picture of religiosity that's simply being plotted against per capita income, it suggests that while rich countries are actually getting more secular, the world overall is getting more religious. And that's because the poorest countries in the world are actually very religious. The one country which is quite the anomaly here is, of course, the United States over there. And here you can see this is a country that is both very rich and very religious. So what's actually going on in the United States? This graph simply looks at recent attitudes to religion using Gallup poll data on religion. The Gallup poll in 2014 asked questions to national adults aged 18 or older living in the United States about religion, and they've been doing these surveys over a 56 year period. So we've actually got data from 1958 all the way up to 2014. And what, one of the questions that they asked uh, was whether religion could answer today's problems or whether it is large old fashioned and out of date. And one of the key findings of the Gallup data is that in 2014, 57% of the US population thought that religion could answer today's problems and about 30% uh, felt that it could not. And of course, one area that religion might actually have some effect on is politics. In a recent ABC News Washington Post poll that was conducted at the end of last year, a sample of US adults were asked which is the single most important issue in their choice for President of the United States. Is it the economy, healthcare, immigration issues, tax policy, or the threat of terrorism? Well, no surprises for guessing what was the top answer. It was the economy, of course. But I, but I think what is less obvious is that terrorism was actually number two on this list and that it was rated considerably higher than healthcare, immigration, or tax policy. So if anything, the opinion surveys seem to corroborate the more general census surveys that religion continues to form a major part of people's lives, at least in some countries, and is seen to be relevant uh, to today's current issues. So what exactly then is the economics of religion? So I would define it as the application of economic and statistical tools to evaluate the role of religion in society. So for example, as important as they are for economists of religion, we are not really asking profoundly philosophical or spiritual questions such as, how do I attain salvation? Uh, the economics of religion does not concern itself with the propagation of personal religious faith. Rather, what we are asking are questions such as, what are the economic costs and benefits to me to believe in salvation? So it does concern economic theories that elucidate religious change or the socioeconomic attributes of religious communities. This research was pioneered by Gary Becker, Larry Anacone, and others from the Chicago School of Economics who were especially interested in non-market behavior arising from social interactions. But this uh, concern with religion is uh, not new, and it's not restricted to scholars of the 21st century. Adam Smith first made reference to the church and the wealth of nations in which he discussed religious competition and wrote especially in favor of church-state separation. Max Weber, in his 1904 book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, um, again argued that economic development in Northern Europe could be explained by the Protestant ethic, which encouraged diligence, thrift, frugality, savings, and literacy in order to read the Bible. And it's really against that backdrop that we need to view current studies in the economics of religion. 
Now, although, as you can see, uh, they encompass a range of areas from macro to economic history to demography to terrorism to insurance and so forth, I think looking at this literature uh, as a whole, uh, there are a couple, two principal themes that emerge. First, identifying uh, theoretically what determines religion and religiosity. And secondly, understanding empirically the microeconomic and macroeconomic consequences of religiosity. This view also looks at spiritual capital or the norms and networks organized on the basis of religion, arguing that these religious networks may be especially important in the context of the links between religion, economics, politics, and conflict. Now, I should say that uh, this religion literature is very diverse. And two years ago, I started writing a paper, which is now forthcoming, um, where I tried to survey what the new economics of religion literature was doing. And at the time, I was actually struck by how much had actually been written on the economics of religion. In this paper, I basically tried to distill uh, a number of themes. And I argue that compared to previous decades, economists today are especially interested in a couple of things. They're interested in theoretical models, uh, including spatial models of religious markets and evolutionary models of religious traits. So they're interested in theoretical work that goes beyond early club goods models. They're very interested in um, empirically trying to look at these religion effects. Economists are very gung-ho about something called identification. And what that means is they're trying to examine causal influences on behavior. So they're looking at things, um, so they're looking at some of these causal influences. The other recent theme in this literature is that there's much more available now on the economic history of religion. That's actually looking at religion as an independent rather than as a dependent variable, whether we can now actually use religion to explain other economic and political outcomes. And another focus of recent research is that there are many more studies of religion outside the Western world. So I argued in this paper that um, there were four themes around which this economics of religion literature was developing. Macroeconomics that was looking at secularization, pluralism, regulation, and economic growth. Microeconomics that was looking at the evolution of markets, club goods, differentiated products, and the role of religious networks econometrics, so identification, trying to look at these uh, causal effects and whether or not religion did have an influence on other variables. And he, this literature is looking both at secular competition and other factors like charitable giving. And the last theme, conflict and cooperation in developing societies. So I think the recent economics of religion literature really spans all of economics, micro, macro, econometrics, economic history, and economic development. And it is really of all of these various themes, my interest both in uh, more studies of religion outside the Western world, as well as my interest in conflict and cooperation in developing societies uh, that actually led me to start working on religious conflict myself and its effect on, on other outcomes. And as a result of that, I started doing some research uh, on India. So some of you know he, that I've been working in India for a very long time on religion, and much of my research does tend to be fieldwork based like this. This, for example, was taken in a madrasa in Uttar Pradesh. And sometimes when I do work on India, uh, I wish that understanding religion there was as simple as this very cooperative road sign. Um, but it isn't. Uh, take a look at this particular graph, which shows the incidence of religious conflict between Hindu and Muslim groups from 1950 to 2006. Uh, the data on religious riots was something that we assembled uh, from newspaper reports in the Times of India that are all held in the India Office archives of the British Library. And so it's an event study. We're basically reading about descriptions of these riots, and then uh, we're, we're putting together a data set on, on where these riots occurred and, and the incidents of conflict. So this is simply the number of riots on the y-axis, the year on the x-axis, and what you see here is that uh, the, the number of incidents of Hindu-Muslim religion-related violence in the country overall for the period 1950 to 2006 shows an upward trend and very significant uh, volatility uh, as well. Alternatively, you might think, how really do we need to be concerned about these religious riots? Because if you look at the intensity of the riots shown here, 
then India doesn't really appear to be an outlier by world standards. So when by riot intensity, what we constructed was a measure of the number of people killed, injured, and arrested on a per capita basis. And this graph shows that actually it's been going down over time. And so one of the things that we were interested in was to examine whether this kind of low level religious violence might actually have other effects on development. And the area that uh, I'm interested in at the moment is politics, which like religion, I've discovered everyone has an opinion on. Now, I should point out that for the remainder of this lecture, I'm going to be talking about some very recent research that I've conducted jointly with one of our really excellent PhD students here, Anand Srivastava. And uh, the research that we're actually working on is religious riots and electoral politics in India. Um, now, so we're not looking here, just to be clear, at high intensity violence. So I'm not talking about Sri Lanka or Kosovo or Sudan. We're talking about low intensity violence and whether it has any effect on, on politics. So in essence, our paper asks a very simple question. Do ethnic parties have an incentive to choose religious violence as a means of voter mobilization? The issue is especially important in India today. For example, these newspaper headlines that I've brought here to show you are all from 2013, 2014, and this is just before the Indian national elections. They gesture towards a seemingly close relationship between Hindu-Muslim religious riots and election outcomes. For those of you here who may be less familiar with India, she's a Hindu-majority country with a significant Muslim minority of about 15%. And the two main political parties in this country over the last 35 years are the Indian National Congress and the Hindu Nationalist Party called the Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP that's referred to in these headlines. Now if we look at the history of riots in India, these riots have actually been recorded since colonial times. There was large-scale violence during the partition of India in 1947, and there were much smaller riots there thereafter with major outbreaks in 1992 and 2002. The causes of Hindu-Muslim riots in India are diverse, and very recent studies by economists and others have suggested that these causes are sometimes economic, sometimes political, and sometimes social. But most recent work by Saumitra Jha at Stanford and David Blakesley in Abu Dhabi have suggested that there might be some kind of correlation going on between riots campaign strategy and the BJP's uh, vote share. So it's really against this kind of background that we tried to do an economic study of riots and elections. We tried to identify something that economists are interested in, the causal impact of Hindu-Muslim riots on the vote share of the BJP in state elections. And we combined data on riots with electoral data from state elections and demographic and public goods data from the census to try and understand this issue. We also suggest in our paper a novel instrument. So for those who are not economists here, you should think about this really as a proxy for riots, something that is related to the riots but is not going to affect other factors that affect uh, the BJP's vote share. And what we suggest is that a possible new instrument uh, one could use um, is, when, uh, is a binary instrument which takes a value one in a year when an important Hindu festival falls on a Friday the holy day for Muslims, and we find that if you use this proxy, uh, riots actually lead to a significant increase in the BJP's vote share, and we're able to actually demonstrate that causality. How do we actually do this? So we use district level annual data on 338 districts in 16 Indian states from 1977 to 2001. So essentially you've got 8,450 district year observations. Our elections data are from the Election Commission of India reports. And here we've simply aggregated electoral constituencies up to the district level because districts and constituencies are separate. And we're using uh, the uh, Election Commission's delimitation order of 1977. Our riots data are um, partly from the Varshney Wilkinson data set. These are two eminent political scientists who put together a data set, again based on the Times of India, Mumbai, um, of riots in India. We've used partly their data, extended it to 2006, 
doing our own research, which I described earlier. And then we have matched towns and villages uh, to districts, and then matched districts in later years to districts as they existed in 1977, because India has actually been changing a lot of her district borders as well. What we then also did, with the help of one of the St. Catharines economists, was to geocode the riot location. So for the whole period, we know exactly the latitude and the longitude of where exactly every single riot occurred. We also matched this to demographic and public goods data from the census. So we looked at the percentage of the Muslim population, literacy, urbanization, the availability of electricity and tap water, and we interpolated linearly for non-census years. So this is what our basic um, model sort of looks like. Our dependent variable, so this is the thing we're trying to explain, uh, is the aggregate vote share of the BJP in an election in District I in year T across all those constituencies in which the BJP fielded a candidate. Our main explanatory variable, this is the variable on riots. It's a binary variable that takes a value one if a riot occurred in District I in year T. For economists amongst you, we included district fixed effects and time trends, but I'm not going to say more about, uh, more about that today. So the number of observations that we have in our first set of results is less than 8,450 because we're only interested in the election years. And as you can see, our coefficient is pretty robust and stable to all combinations of control. So this is sort of simply suggesting that the riots do seem to have some kind of effect on the BJP vote share. But before we can sort of run away and actually conclude that, um, the economist will stop you and will say that there is one major problem when you're trying to look at a relationship between riots and uh, vote share. And that is something that they call endogeneity. And that's because there could be omitted variables or reverse causality that's also going on in trying to assess this relationship. Why might there be omitted variables? Supposing there's increasing inequality in the society, that could affect both riots and vote share. On the other hand, you could have reverse causality. Riots could simply be happening in anticipation of the BJP actually doing well. So we need to deal with this issue. And this is where we actually went to um, history and anthropology and political science to help us actually deal with that issue. If you look at anecdotal evidence from newspaper reports that was actually used to construct the riots data, we find that a number of those riots actually occurred when religious processions were actually taken out on days of religious significance. And in this context, Mukul Keshavan in uh, The Telegraph in 2014 wrote, and when Hindu and Muslim festivals coincided on the calendar, the right to march through a Muslim neighborhood or the right to play music before mosques could lead to confrontations that end in rioting and murder. So what we suggest is that for Muslims, Friday, uh, Fridays are very important religiously because special weekly prayers are held in mosques on those days. And these have very large congregations of people sort of milling around the mosque. The Hindus also have a very large number of festivals that vary by region. And the day on which these festivals fall actually depends on a, a lunar calendar. So that is uh, the exogenous source of variation. So we contend that in a year when in a given region an important Hindu festival also falls on a Friday, the chances of a riot happening is actually much higher. Moreover, these riots might actually happen on the festival day itself or as a result of communal tensions created on the festival day or indeed in anticipation of it. And this is just to illustrate why we think these festivals are so important. Uh, this is a picture of the Hindu festival of Dasera, which is a tribute to the Hindu mother goddess uh, Durga, who's basically shown here. It's a very beautiful festival. And all over India during the time of the festival, which sort of goes on for 10 days, processions like these are being uh, uh, t taken out to celebrate the festival. But as you can see, although it is very beautiful, it is also very crowded. And um, there's lots of people milling about. So this can cause contestation over, over public spaces. So how do we actually use the anthropological idea of the festival being important in this kind of statistical analysis? 
We construct our instrument or proxy by listing the important Hindu festivals celebrated in each state. We use the government list of public holidays, so famous festivals like Diwali and Dasara, which are national festivals, as well as regional ones like Holi and Ganesh Chaturthi. We select the top five for each state, and we find out the years in which each of these festivals actually fall on a Friday. We then assign a value one to the instrument for all those districts in a state in a year where when one of those five festivals for that state falls on a Friday. And the results shown here is simply telling you in plain English that this festival instrument is a very good predictor of, us, uh, of the riots in, in, uh, in, in the previous year, because the festival has to be correlated with riots in the previous year. So what are our main results? Our main results are based, uh, for economists here, you will be interested, the first two are our reduced form regressions, our last two are our instrumental variable regressions uh, with district fixed effects. We don't have a weak instrument problem. It means that our festival in idea is actually working quite well. But the IV coefficient here is simply indicating that a 30% uh, vote share gain is implied for the BJP. So in plain English, what do these numbers mean? They're simply saying that whenever a riot happens in a year where a Hindu festival falls on a Friday, an election in the next year will almost certainly result in a BJP victory. Now, this is patently unrealistic. So what we argue in the paper is that we need to correct for some biases that are actually influencing this outcome. And the biases that we need to correct for are the larger area of effect of the riots and underreporting of the riots as well. So remember that we've assumed until now that a riot occurring in the district is only going to influence the election results only in that district. But of course, the electoral effect of the riot might actually extend well beyond the district in which it occurs. And so to correct for this bias, we assume that the electoral results are affected by the riot occurring nearest to the district and that that effect essentially decays with distance. So we geocode the location of all of our riots and obtain the distance of the riot occurring nearest to the district in the year before the election. We have to find a standard deviation to fit our Gaussian functions. And what we find when we do this analysis from the data is that a standard deviation of about 200 kilometers seems to provide the best fit. And so the equivalent coefficient estimate is about 0.081. So our best estimate that takes into account the effect of the riot is 0.081. Now, the diameter of an average district in India is about 100 kilometers. So if we assume that the effect dies out after two standard deviations, then this would imply that a riot affects uh, districts, elections uh, up to four districts away. Now, since we're using newspaper reports uh, of riot activity, it is possible that the underreporting of riots might also bias our estimates as well. And in the paper on which this is based, we actually derive an expression for that bias. What it means very simply is that a lower rate of reporting P implies a higher bias coefficient estimate. So what we try to do is to use two other studies to try and assess how much underreporting is really going on in our data. So the first study that we use to compare uh, our work with is that uh, by Saumit Raja at Stanford. He looked at Hindu-Muslim riots in Gujarat between 27th February and 15th April 2002, and it leads to a reporting rate of 0.77. How do we get that? It means that in that period, Jha found 30 riots, we only found 23. That's how we get the underreporting rate. But of course, that's a very short period. It's only a few months. So then we also looked at the political scientist Paul Brass's work. He uses very in-depth, um, you know, bureaucratic reports, NGO accounts, and news reports to document riots in the city of Aligarh uh, for a very long period from 1977 to 1995. So we can actually compare our results much more cleanly with the political science results, and there we get an underreporting rate of 0 0.83. If we use an average value of these two, so roughly if we take 0.8 and apply that underreporting correction to our coefficient estimate of 0 0.081, we get the value of the estimate as 0 0.065. So what that means is that this is simply a lower bound on our result, and the actual coefficient is going to be somewhere between 0 0.065 and 0 0.081. So what we've really established here is that we can actually find using
using our festival instrument, the causal impact of riots on elections in the increase in the vote share of the BJP. And we estimate that it is anywhere between 6.5 and 8.1 percentage points. But of course, these are simply numbers. The more interesting question is, um, why is this increase actually taking place? What could be the possible mechanisms that explain why riots might actually lead to, uh, election, uh, to, to uh, increased vote share? So there could be a range of mechanisms. So one possibility is simply turnout. Riots could be leading to a reduction in turnout because of a perception of fear among minorities. So they stay at home, and this simply increases the vote share of the Hindu majority BJP party. But when we actually looked at this, we found that there was no real effect of the riots on voter turnout, and this does not change appreciably with the change in the percentage of the Muslim population. So here, the point estimate is in blue. The confidence intervals are around. We've, we're running these regressions on rolling observations of about 500 as the percentage of the Muslim population in the district is increasing. And as you can see, there's no real reduction in voter turnout. Um, so this is not going to be one possible ex mechanism for why um, the riots are actually having an effect on turnout. The other possibility is simply that a riot would lead to a change in a person's ideology and party affiliation. And we try to test that. And again, we find that the effect of the riots is strongest right here in an election in the subsequent year and then completely dies out thereafter. So there's no effect two years before the election, three years before the election, and so forth. And so there is no permanent change in ideology or party affiliation as a result of the riots. Now, if it isn't um, turnout and it isn't some kind of learning because there's no persistent effect, then it must be this. And that is polarization. And it leads us to conclude, as Paul Brass and others first suggested, that religious riots might actually lead to the religious identity of the voters becoming more salient, causing them to actually vote for political parties that represent that identity, and that this is the most likely uh, mechanism. What we also do, is, uh, which is something we need to do in economics papers nowadays, is a number of robustness checks to make sure that our results are robust. We drop 1992, 93, and redo the analysis, because that was the year of the Babri Masjid riots caused by the disputed mosque in Ayodhya. We don't want one year to be driving all our results. We drop Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir, which are non-Hindu majority states, uh, because they've got different demographics. They've also got separatist <coughs> movements. Uh, we also conducted the similar regressions, not just for the BJP, but for the other party, the Indian National Congress. And again, there we find a significant negative, uh, negative effect. So there's some literature in political science that suggests that having a Congress government is actually better for riots than having, having a BJP government. So we're actually finding some support for that as well. So how does our research inform the debate about the effects of religious conflict? Well, we know that religious conflict per se is a bad thing. But I think what our work using statistical methods from economics is showing is that it can have effects well beyond religion. It can affect politics as well. And in our research, we're simply asking if religious violence can be used, apart from other factors, as an alternative tool to mobilize uh, voters for electoral gain. We're showing that Hindu-Muslim riots do lead to a significant gain in vote share in state elections for the BJP. We're suggesting the new festival instrument. We're correcting for biases resulting from the larger area of effect and the underreporting of riots. And while we cannot prove the validity of any one mechanism that explains our findings, we do think that temporary polarization along some of these communal lines might actually be quite important. So, what is the future of religion and the new economics of religion? Well, according to Lewis, the learned have their superstitions, prominent among them a belief that superstition is evaporating. So, I guess we shouldn't be too superstitious. Religion is here to stay, and economists are much more interested in its effects today than they have been at any other time previously. Research in the economics of religion is thriving, and it concerns both theoretical work and empirical studies. 
drawing a perspective on this, it strikes me that emerging economies are experiencing appreciable modern economic growth, yet this is coterminous with the increasing resilience of religious institutions and conflict that seems to affect their outcomes. And it is this dichotomy between the sacred and the secular which epitomizes the puzzle of the relationship between religion and economics. But for any economist seeking to engage with the study of religion, this is not for the faint-hearted. There are significant challenges that still remain. First, to understand these endogenous interactions between religion and other economic and political variables. For example, is it religion which affects economic growth or economic growth that affects religion? How does religious conflict actually affect politics and political processes? Secondly, how much does all of this really matter? What are the techniques and methods that can be used to quantify these interactions? And thirdly, and as a consequence, how do we evaluate more widely the impact of religion on economic policy or indeed the influence of economic policy on religion? I think what the current research is showing is that while religion can play a very positive role in local communities, it can also further conflict. So we need better to understand how to manage interfaith relations in these religiously pluralistic populations. Finally, let me simply end by showing you one of my favorite pictures of religious conflict in India. Now this is a whole other religion in South Asia. It's a cricket match between a Hindu temple and a local mosque in Maharashtra, taken during the celebrations of a Hindu festival called Diwali, which thankfully in that year did not fall on a Friday. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that. It was very fascinating, especially um, from a Thomas background. Any questions? How much attention are governments starting to pay to this when forming policy? And if not, do you think it's something that they will be able to make use of to create better policy in the future? That's a great question. So I think um, one of the issues is that because we haven't had much data on religion in the past, we know it has an effect. But I think once there are more studies of this kind that are done, um, I'm sure governments will be interested in this research. Now, in, in this particular case, I haven't actually shown this research to the BJP at the moment. I don't think I'll be terribly popular if I do. Uh, but, but I think that it is, it is important for them to take some of these quantitative studies and other studies uh, into account. Um, there is some dialogue going on between big organizations who are interested, who pr you know, provide these kinds of data, like the Pew Trusts and others. Um, and they are providing a lot of data which people can access and I think government departments are looking at some of these data as well. But I think the difficulty with religion is it's a very controversial issue, um, which means that to some extent um, they need to be thinking a little bit about how effectively to use this data. In fact, the Pew Trusts are going to be doing for the first time in South Asia a major study of religion over the next two to three years. And that will be the first time this kind of major study has actually been done. So I suspect as more of this data becomes available, more governments are going to want to use it. Any other questions? I know most of your research focuses on, focuses on India. Um, do you have any idea, kind of, maybe you can have to guess what it would be like for other areas or in particular regions that it might be? Yes. So, so ours is one of the first studies that's tried to link the religion, uh, religious conflict with the voting behavior. But there are a few other studies that have also tried to sort of say that this might be important in other contexts. So there's a very nice study by Berebi and Klor, uh, who again were two economists, and they've been looking at Israel. And they were showing that if you had religion-related violence in Israel, this was sort of increasing the vote share of the, of the right-wing parties. There's also some very nice work by Christopher Blattman uh, in Uganda, where he's been trying to, again, he's been pointing out that the, the religion and politics might actually be related in this way. Our own colleague in the Cambridge Economics faculty, Toke Ait, has a very interesting paper on the swing riots of 1830-31 in, um, in the UK and how this increased um, uh, uh, pl uh, voting um, votes for pro-electoral reform politicians. So I think there are a few studies here and there that are looking at some of these uh, relationships. Uh, it's there in Uganda, it's there in the UK, it's there in uh, Israel, and now we've done this study in India. But I think part of the problem with the economic studies is establishing this causality thing is quite a big deal for us. 
beyond economics, there are many studies that are actually saying these two variables are related, but they stop at correlations. Uh, they're not actually saying that it definitely causes this kind and putting a number on that. But, it's, but I think we're hoping that with more of these studies and with more of the data becoming available, we'll be able to see if there is, I mean, the, the, um, if our study actually is true, then I think there are very serious policy consequences that we would need to, you know, need to think about a bit more deeply because you wouldn't want these studies to be used by politicians as a way of actually, you know, mobilize, mobilizing voters. So it's a difficult area. Continuing on that last point, though, if you're going to submit the results of your study to politicians, I mean, the current government is BJP. What's the morality of doing that? I think it's more we just wanted to document this. I mean, so, so the headlines I showed you from 2013, 2014, that concerned a lot of people, I think, in, in, in India at the time. We're not, of course, looking at it for this election. We're looking at a, a, a period that's much earlier, 1977 to 2001. But the factors are very much the same. I think um, simply documenting this is important because it means, I think, at the local level, you've got councillors and others who I think during election times can just be more vigilant. You can have uh, police at, around during these areas at the time of elections and before just to make sure that, that um, you know, these riots are not just being instigated in order to increase the vote share. So I think there are policy implications. I mean, the central government might not be interested in it, but I think the state governments will be very interested in using this as a way of actually uh, thinking about policy and how to handle the periods just before elections. Just um, I'm quite intrigued by the time lag. Um, you were talking about like, the temporary polarization and how one year seemed to be like the, the huge mark. And then the graph actually showed two years being all the way down and three years. It was not significantly different from zero. So yeah, yeah, so it's just temporary is what we're finding in our, in our sample. Could I also ask, then what about zero years or like within, I mean that one year period, would you consider breaking it down to like maybe six months, three months, you know? Where is that kind of threshold before people forget about their, their conflict and it's a great point. So I didn't present that result, but it's in the paper. We've done the monthly analysis as well as the yearly, uh, the yearly analysis. And uh, yeah, so we've done it in terms of looking at whether the, the, the month effect is going to be as important. Um, Indian elections tend to be in February, November, and April. There's a certain months when which they're held. Uh, and you know, our, our results are robust to doing it at the monthly level as well as at the yearly level. I was only presenting the, the annual result, but it's, it's a great point. Yes? It would be great if you could comment on <coughs> why religion turned from being a dependent variable to the independent variable. Why it's shifted? Yeah. The, uh, in, in terms of how the research has actually moved. So I think a lot of the early research in at least the economics and sociology of religion is very dominated by Weber. Um, and, and, and certainly, I think, um, l well, looking at, at whether religion is, going, is influencing income and so forth, but also they, there's a lot of literature that looks at the evolution of religious movements and what are the kinds of factors that are, are driving uh, the way in which religious groups actually form and so forth. Um, now, nowadays, I think partly because of the availability of, of data as well as the availability of more sophisticated statistical methodologies, for the economists at least, we're now interested in looking at the effect of religion on wider outcomes like politics or you know, other economic phenomena and so forth. But I think uh, if we want to just think about, you know, there is still a lot of research at the moment that doesn't just want to look at religion as an independent variable, but does actually look at religion as, as a dependent variable. So some of the work that I've been doing, for example, has been looking at religion and public goods provision also in the Indian context. And looking at how in, um, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, and Jain groups in India are actually evolving in terms of providing public services, and whether that influences religiosity or not in, in areas. We did a very large study of that, which I'm writing a book about at the moment. So uh, there is plenty of research on religion as, as um, you know, a dependent variable still, but that's, I think, where the research was coming from. Now, uh, looking at religion as an independent variable has become, uh, I think, more important just because of the availability of the data, I think, in large sense, and, and what's going on around us. Yes, sure. Do you find any significant um, difference and trend in terms of the effect of uh, inter-ethnic group uh, inequality um, you know, in terms of 
think are more um, access and services and that's the relationship then with the uh, riots and the and the, the tensions we're finding yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so this research was not looking at inequality and looking at whether it had any effect. We have the other paper, which I talked about at the Joan Robinson Society, which is the paper that where we've shown, actually in the Indian context, that income inequality matters a great deal, both for the Hindu and Muslim groups, and especially for the services that they're providing in terms of education, healthcare, and other, and other services. Um, so yes, I mean, I think inequality is basically driving a lot of these trends. Whether it's actually affecting uh, the riots, my feeling is it's probably, uh, we need to identify the mechanism through which inequality is actually having the effect on riots. Is it because it's inequality because of lack of access to public goods like water, education, healthcare? My feeling is that's the channel through which it's probably working. Um, and if that is the channel, then yes, there's definitely evidence that that's contributing to the riots. So for example, uh, some areas of India which are poorer and have less access to public goods, there are higher numbers of riots in those areas than areas that are richer and which have done well from the trade liberalization, for example. So that's definitely a big factor that's, that's going on here. We didn't take it into account in, the, in this study. This was looking more just at the religion and the political processes, but it's certainly an important factor. You mentioned how you guys like you focus on low intensity riots, and I was just wondering what so the effect would I mean presumably significantly larger for kind of high intensity riots and it's the same research. Yes, yeah, so, so high intensity riot is civil war, basically. So we so we know that civil wars all over the world have had huge effects on income, growth, on public goods. And so that, I think, has been very clearly demonstrated by lots of, lots of people who've been researching in those areas. But I think this uh, aspect, the low intensity riots and its relation particularly to electoral politics, I don't think many people are actually working in, in this space. There's lots of political scientists working in this space, but not too many economists. So this is why we wanted to focus on the low intensity um, riots. Also because it isn't just India. There's lots of other examples of that. So race riots in the United States, the Basque um, movement in Spain, all of these are other examples of low intensity conflict that could have an outcome on political processes. And uh, so we were not, we, we um, specifically stayed away from looking at the Sri Lanka and the Kosovo and the, you know, the, the Sudan, the, the high intensity conflicts, because many, there is a lot of research on those areas anyway. And we really went to focus on, uh, on, on the low intensity. Any more questions? Great. Otherwise, I think one last round of applause. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.